This Let's Edit with MIDI Composer tutorial is brought to you by VideoGuys.com, the leading reseller of video editing and production equipment for more than 25 years. Check out VideoGuys.com for great deals on Avid MIDI Composer software licenses, subscriptions, and upgrades, and use coupon code MC101 for 5% off any purchase. Hey everyone, Kevin P. McAuliffe here and I am back again with another Media Composer 101 tutorial. And in this week's lesson, we're going to start our multi-part look at your settings. Now the settings are obviously very important because you're going to get in and as you sort of saw a little bit in our look at bins, settings are where you're going to get in and really sort of tailor your Media Composer project how you want so that all the little bells and whistles that you're getting in and adjusting are going to help you edit at the best possible speed. Now it's also important to keep in mind, especially if you're a freelance editor, is that the settings are something that you can take with you from system to system to basically be able to sit down and get up and running the way you like so you can get your client's projects done as quickly as possible. Okay, short introduction. Let's just get into Media Composer and let's get started. Okay, so let's command and tab into Media Composer, obviously an alt and tab for all my Windows friends out there. And I do want to point out, as always, that we are using the most current version of Media Composer as of this recording, and that is version 8.2. Okay, now, a couple things that are important to understand about settings before we get started. You'll remember we talked about bins a little while ago. And if I want to get in and I want to open a bin from another project, it's very simple. All I need to do is simply press Command and O on the Mac, Control and O on Windows. And of course, I'm going to be brought to the Open Bin screen. I can go through, pick whichever bin that I want. Now what's important to keep in mind is that that is obviously the way that we open a bin from another project. But what's going to happen is, is that as soon as you come over and you change to the settings tab, if you were to do the same thing and press command and O on the Mac control and O on Windows, you see that things are a little bit different now. What we're basically being asked to do is to open a setting or a preference inside a Media Composer. Now how does all of this sort of play out? Well, this is where you're going to be able to get in and basically be able to take your settings, copy them onto a USB key, and take them to another location with you and get, you know basically pop them in, get set up, and be running literally in a matter of seconds as opposed to getting in, you know, maybe you're constantly updating the keyboard setting. Don't worry, we're going to get to the keyboard setting because that's probably one of the most important settings. But really how you can get in, drop the keyboard setting in, and boom, you're off to the races, ready to go right away. Okay, now, I guess I should actually talk about where your settings are actually located. So if I hide out a Media Composer by simply hitting Command and H on the Mac, or we can obviously minimize on Windows, what I'm going to do is I'm going to come to the Macintosh hard drive. I'm going to come into Users. Now, I'm not going to go into my personal folder, because what's important to keep in mind is that Media Composer, because you could have one log into a computer and have multiple different users, obviously on the Mac, we're going to want to go to the Shared folder. Inside of the shared folder, we're going to go to the Avid Media Composer folder, and inside there you're going to see a folder called, appropriately enough, Avid Users, and you can simply go into that folder to find your user setting and copy it onto a USB key. Now, for all my Windows friends out there, you're probably thinking, well, hey, hang on a second, I'm on a Windows machine. Well, how do I find the user settings? No problem. You can actually see that I've displayed it right down here at the bottom of the screen. Now here's something else that's important to keep in mind is that what I normally tell people is do not take your user settings and actually copy them onto you know whatever system you happen to be on and start working with them. Now you're probably thinking, well Kev, you just told us that we could do that. Why are you suddenly telling us not to do that? Well, the only reason that I'm telling you to actually not do that method specifically is because sort of my sort of guaranteed workflow so that you never have any conflict with user settings or anything like that is to always create new user settings on whatever system you're sitting down in front of. Now, in this case, you can see that I have my user settings set here. But what I also have is I have a user profile called, appropriately enough, the test man user profile, which is perfectly fine for the purposes of what we're doing. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to assume for argument's sake I've popped in a USB key. So what I'm actually going to do here is I'm just going to hide back to the desktop and I'm going to take these settings. Let me just come back to users. I'm going to come to shared. I'm just going to come into the Media Composer folder. I'm going to come into the users and let me just take test man. I'm just going to stick it on the desktop for now. Okay. Because we're going to assume that we'd popped in our USB key and I copied my settings onto the desktop. Now, I don't really care if I have them in the drop down here because what I'm going to do is I'm going to basically just create a new user profile. I'd call it, you know, whatever my name happens to be and call it, you know, you know, K McAuliffe settings. 
And then what I'm going to do is much like opening a bin with Command and O, Control and O for my Windows friends, I'm going to hit Command and O to open these user settings. What I'm going to do is navigate to the desktop to the Userman profile and there's the settings right there. Once I open them, you're going to see what's going to happen is a window is going to open that looks exactly like my settings in my project window here. Let me actually just bring this down here. There we go. And you can see that I have everything in here, including my export settings, my bin settings, and probably the most important one, my keyboard setting. Now, basically to get in an update or to add to any of these settings, and let me just show you what I mean here. Let me actually just take a couple of these. I'm just going to delete a whole bunch of these here that I know I'm probably not going to use. I'll just delete. Well, why don't I just delete all of them? Because at some point here, I'm just going to end up recreating them anyway. So let me just delete all those here. And all I'm going to do is I'm just going to take a an export setting here, and we'll just pick one at random. Doesn't even really matter which one. Let's just take, oh, I don't know, the Sorensen squeeze ones right here. I'm just basically going to select them. I'm going to drag them over here and drop them. And you're going to see that's going to say, well, hold on. Do you want to add these settings to the current settings or use them to replace the active settings? I'm just going to add them in there. And you can see now that I have them added here. Now where that sort of uh, that pop-up menu really becomes in, comes into play is if I'm doing something like moving a keyboard setting. So what I'm going to do is let me just come to my keyboard settings here. I just have the one keyboard setting. So let me just come over here. And what I'm going to do here is I just take my one keyboard setting. And in this case, what I would do is take the keyboard, I would drag it over and it's going to say, well, hold on, do you want to add or do you want to replace? If I add, it's going to add another keyboard setting under keyboard. But what I want to do in this case is to simply replace. Now, in this case, my user setting for keyboard would be, would be replaced. And literally, I could sit down and start editing with all my keyboard shortcuts in a matter of seconds. So this is how I always tell people to work when you're bringing over your user settings. Don't get in and take that user settings and copy it into that Avid Users folder. Create new settings on whatever system you happen to be working on. Take your settings from your jump disk or wherever you happen to get them. Maybe you email them to yourself and download them onto the desktop. And then simply open them like this and start dragging and dropping over the, the settings that you want to make sure you don't run into any issues. Okay, so let's move on. And I'm just going to close this here. I'm not going to save. And I want to talk about, we're going to actually start talking about a few of these settings. Like I said, this is going to be a multi-part tutorial just because there's so many settings to talk about. And I'm not going to be talking about every single little parameter inside each one of these because we'd be here for a long time. I'm just going to point out the most important ones to you. Okay, and first, right up at the top, let's talk about AMA settings. AMA is obviously your way to be able to take clips and link to them, or, you know, now I'm talking specifically about QuickTime files, or maybe you have a DS DSLR camera, maybe you have an XD cam camera, you know, maybe you have, you know, an XD cam drive that you've plugged into your system, and you're going to want to be able to get in and start either editing with that footage or be able to actually get it into a bin to transcode it to start working with right away. Well, our first option here, bins, what do we want to do as soon as a new AMA volume is seen? Do we want to use it as the active bin? Do we want to create a new bin? What do we want to have, you know, as a default, uh, default volume name? We could specify the actual name here. And what do we want to display? Do we want to display the imported head frame or display the editor head frame? Under quality, in most cases, you're going to leave all of this as the highest quality. But more importantly, inside of volume mounting, you want to make sure that automatically AMA link to volumes is selected. If it's not, what you're going to have to do is be going up to file and go down to link to AMA volume. But in this case, as soon as you plug in a volume that Media Composer understands, it's immediately going to open a new bin and populate it with the clips that it finds right in your project. Okay. A couple other things that I do want to show you, and most of them are right here inside of link options. First is multi-channel audio. How do you want Media Composer to deal with that? What's actually very cool is I could say, okay, well, right now they're all going to come in as mono channels, but maybe I want to have the first five channels to be 5.1, left, right, center, sub, left, surround, right, surround, boom, there we go. It's always going to bring in those files just like that. And if this is the proper audio configuration for 5.1, we would have 7 and 8 marked as stereo. So in this case, Anything that's on channels 1 through 6 is going to be brought in as 5.1 as a 5.1 clip. 7 and 8 will be stereo, and anything above that will come in as mono. Pretty cool. Okay, next, what do we want to have our broadcast wave files audio timecode rate set to? In most cases, you're going to leave this set to be the project rate. And last inside AMA settings, how do you want your alpha channels interpreted for any clips that you happen to option or alt drag into your bin? 
to AMA link to them. Do you want to have black being opaque? In most cases for me, I have white as opaque. So that's pretty much as far as your AMA settings. The only things that you really need to get in and concern yourself with. I'm just going to say okay. Now this is one that always throws people for a loop, audio, because what will happen is people will start bringing their clips and they'll start playing them back and say, why are all my clips mono? Because as, def as by default inside your audio settings, your default pan for mono tracks is set to be centered. But you know, remember when you're bringing in clips that are considered quote unquote mono, just because you have something on channel one and something on channel two doesn't mean they're mono. Those could be making up a stereo pair. So for me, I always make sure that my default pan for mono tracks is to alternate left and right, meaning one is left, two is right, three is. So basically all the odd numbers are left. So one, three, five, seven, nine, and all the even numbers, two, four, six, eight, ten, are your right channels. Okay, so let's just close that up here. Now, of course, we did talk about our bin settings, so we don't need to get in and talk about those anymore. Now I'm gonna leave my capture settings and my deck settings alone for now. We're gonna talk more about those when we get in and talk about capturing. Let's talk about the composer settings, because composer settings, and in composer settings, really, it's the window that you're gonna to wanna to get in and adjust. Obviously, like I said, we have a few more options in here. But really, window is the most important one. Now, very first option we have, data display at the top. Now remember, the composer window that we're talking about is this window right up here at the top of the screen, obviously where your preview screen and your record screen is. So do you want to have the display data, that would be the information right in here, to be set to off? We could just turn that off. If I was to say OK, it's going to disappear. But in most cases for me, I always like to have two rows of data because the more data that you have, the better off you'll be when you're editing. Now, flow data dynamically means that as I adjust the size of this window, I'll be getting more or less information depending on what's happening with this window. Now, next, button display at bottom. That would be this button display down here. Now, right now it's set to one row. Now, some people will set this to be two rows. For me, to be perfectly honest, in a lot of cases, I would actually set this to off. Now, why would I set that to off? Because I find a lot of people become reliant on these buttons here. And I was always taught back at Sheridan College by Didier Kennel that you edit with your right hand or you use the mouse with your right hand, the keyboard is on your left hand. And really, if you're doing all of your, your buttons with your left hand on the keyboard, you shouldn't need to be moving up here to the composer window, which means you're gonna be a much faster editor when the time comes to really get up to speed and be getting those projects done. So what I'm gonna do just by default is I'm gonna leave it as one row of information here. And you'll see that we can have a center duration which is located right up here and we can have tick marks in position bars. All I'm gonna do is simply say, okay, nothing is gonna change inside of the composer window. And let's move on and let's talk about a couple more of these before we wrap up this lesson. I'm gonna talk a little bit about a hidden gem as far as your settings go. And that's right here, the email option. A lot of people don't use this, and I always think it's a very cool, very underutilized setting. What this setting will basically do is let you set up Media Composer to send you an email when a renders complete, an exports complete, or a consolidate or transcode is complete. So you can basically get in, add in your SMTP server information, including username and password, as far as your email settings, who it's coming from and who it's basically going to. Up here you can set the email events to be, in most cases you'd set this to be everything. And right down here you can see as far as the master email control, you can enable the sending of emails, send yourself a test email, and now basically if you're rendering, exporting, or consolidating or transcoding, this is a great way to have Media Composer, once it's done, send you an email. Let's say you had a ton of transcoding you had to do, and you really had to go and do something. You know, Maybe it was like Christmas shopping or birthday shopping or something like that. Guess what? Go off, do what you have to do, and have Media Composer tell you when it's time to come back to start editing. A very cool little setting that I don't think very many people use, but it's very handy to have. Okay, now last but certainly not least, before we wrap this up here, actually what I should do is not say okay, I wanna say cancel because I didn't enter any of that information. Let's come down and let's talk about our grid settings. Now I'm gonna talk about the general settings when we get in and start creating sequences. So let's talk about the grid settings. Now what is a grid exactly? Well, the grid, and what I'm gonna do here is let me just see if I've actually got the grid in here. There we go, there's our grid settings right there. Now I actually need to have a clip, so let's get a clip in here to work with. What I'm gonna do is just open a bin here, we'll just open it, actually what I think I'll do is I'll just import some clips right here, okay? 
Actually, perfect. I've actually already got some clips here. Very nice. So I'm just going to take one of these. We'll just drop it into a new timeline. And let's call up the grid. Now, the grid actually is already up. You can see it right here. Now, what is the grid? Well, the grid is basically your safe title and safe picture board. As you'll see, the inside is safe title. Outside is safe picture. Now, obviously, any titles need to stay with inside safe title. And obviously, anything that's important for your customers or your basically your viewers to see needs to stay within safe picture. Now, in most cases, people say, well, Kev, you know what? That's a guideline. I'm not going to use it. But what's important to keep in mind is that many TV stations have strict regulations as far as picture safe and title safe. And they do require all titles to be located inside of title safe. Now, inside of our grid settings, if I come back to settings here, let's come down to grid. The very first sort of important option here is if I come to display, is that I can actually change the color of this grid. So right now it's set to white, but maybe I want to set it to be, you know, green or something like that. Let's just apply that. There we go. So, you know, something that really stands out. You see that we can get in and we can show four by nine zones, one six six aspects, et cetera, et cetera. But what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to ignore all that because a lot of all the, a lot of all this information in here is bells and whistles because there's really only two things that are important here. One is the color of your grid. The other is the type of grid you're showing. Now, believe it or not, I'm actually going to make a duplicate of this grid setting. So all I'm going to do is I'm going to come back to my settings. I'm going to hit Command and D on the Mac, Control and D on Windows to create a new grid setting. And I'm going to double click on it. Now, this is adjusting the new setting, not the old one. Okay. What we're going to do is we're going to come back to coordinates and I'm going to set up a new save title because one thing you're going to hear a lot about is 4x3 save. Now, what exactly does that mean? Well, let me show you. What I'm going to do is I'm going to change my scale mode here from normal to be 4x3 inside of a 16x9 monitor. All I'm going to do now is simply come down and I'm going to say OK. Now, as soon as I do, you're going to notice that nothing has happened. Well, what I've basically done now is I've set up two grid settings. And what we're going to do is we're actually just going to come in here and I'm going to add in some information. I'm going to call this 16 by 9 safe. Let's actually make sure we spell that correctly here. There we go. Okay. The next grid setting I'm going to call 4 by 3 safe. And now you're thinking, well, Kev, I'm working in an HD project. What do I care about that? Well, what I'm going to do is over here on the left, the little check mark that's beside the 16 by 9 safe, I'm going to switch to be the 4 by 3 safe. Now, as soon as I do, you can see that I now have a standard definition frame size inside of my 16 by 9 screen. So what exactly is going on here? Well, what we're basically doing is we're taking a look at what's called 4x3 safe. If our HD image was taken and down converted to be 4x3, not letterbox, but edge cropped, what I would be seeing is what would be seen inside of a 4x3 television. You'll hear Many television stations will want your supers to be inside of 4x3 title safe. Well, this is how you're going to get in and easily set that up. You're now going to want all your titles to sit in this area here, basically the inside green box. Now, what I encourage you to do now is to start watching HD shows, especially the bugs that appear at the bottom of the screen, you know, showing the network uh, logo and things like that. In a lot of cases, you're going to wonder, why are they so far towards the middle of the screen? Well, that's why, because they're abiding by the 4x3 safe rule that obviously whatever the station is airing it has it set to. Okay, we've really just scratched the surface of settings. In our next lesson, we're actually going to talk about something a little bit different. We're actually going to be talking about the next update to Media Composer, the 8.3 update. And I'm going to show you all of the new features to get you really excited and to show you that making the choice to go with a Media Composer subscription was definitely the right choice. Now, before I wrap up this lesson, I want to thank our sponsor, Video Guys. And don't forget to check them out and use coupon code MC101 for 5% off your Avid purchase or any other purchase, including G Technology Storage, software plugins, and so much more. And if you like this tutorial, please click that subscribe button. And don't forget that if you have any questions, you have any comments, or you have any tutorial requests, you can post them in the comment section below this lesson, or you can send them to Kevin P. McAuliffe at gmail.com. This has been Kevin P. McAuliffe. Thanks a lot for watching.